Welcome, welcome, welcome to the very first episode of the Ready Brew Podcast. Uh, today's episode title is Proper Perspective. Let's get into it. Today's uh, episode topic is proper perspective, proper perspective. Uh, The reason um, that I call it proper perspective is because uh, for so many years, we've been programmed to look at scriptures from the wrong viewpoint. Uh, Many, uh, well, a few years ago, um, I did this message um, at my local church uh, called Vantage Point. Uh, And in that message, basically what I was saying was that um, everybody has a different vantage point from which they uh, view God. Um, And and although uh, we all have different vantage points, uh, we do have to take some responsibility in making sure that we're saying properly, that we're saying correctly. So um, in today's episode, uh, we want to look at um, what the proper vantage point is um, or the proper perspective. How are we going to see the scriptures in their proper perspective? Now, um, this is just a disclaimer. Um, I do understand that I might lose some friends. I do understand that I might get a lot of criticism, but I am willing to put myself out there just for the sake of the scripture, for the sake of the gospel, um, the gospel message, which is to take the gospel of the kingdom of God to all nations. So um, let's get into it. Um, the first scripture that uh, I'm going to start off with um, is Isaiah 44. Uh, and we're going to begin at verse 1. Yet now here, O Jacob, my servant, and Israel, whom I have chosen. Thus saith the Lord that made thee and formed thee from the womb, which will help thee. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, that thou, Jeshurun, whom I have chosen, for I will pour water upon him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon thy seed and my blessing upon thine offspring. And thy shall spring up as among the grass, as willows by the water courses. One shall say, I am the Lord's, and another shall call himself by the name of Jacob, and another shall subscribe with his hand unto the Lord, and surname himself by the name of Israel. Wow. Wow, wow. I want to highlight um, verse number five again. That was was Isaiah 44, verses 1 through 5. And I'd like to highlight verse number 5 again. Uh, Verse number 5. One shall say, I am the Lord's. And another shall call himself by the name of Jacob. And another shall subscribe with his hand unto the Lord. And surname himself by the name of Israel. So, um, I know you may be asking yourself, what in the world does this have to do with perspective? Why would we need to look at this passage of scripture when we're talking about perspective? Well, it's easy. In these last few years, there has been a sort of awakening 
if you will, of those of us who are claiming to be the seed of Abraham, claiming to be not just the spiritual seed, but the physical seed of Jacob. Um, and I think this scripture um, says a lot about what's happening now. Now, um, how do I want to say this? I, I am not here to argue about um, who said what or um, what doctrine disproves this because because today has happened these these days have come to pass now, I'm not saying that the world is going to end I'm not saying that Christ is going to split the sky next week next year 10 years from now what I'm saying is that these things that were spoken of the scripture of Israel waking up is happening it's not like people got on the phone and say, hey, I, I think we should subscribe to be this. I know me personally, um, my curiosity arose trying to disprove what, what I've been hearing for so many years. And praying and asking God to reveal things to me. So um, I think the Most High has put me on this path, um, not just to prove that we are Israel, but to teach through the scripture. So um, enough about that. Let's get into uh, proper perspective. Um, and, and, and the reason uh, proper perspective is because we have to begin reading the Bible in its proper context. Christianity is great when it comes to not from scriptures, from other men's uh, ideas and teachings. Uh, it's great and giving you a perspective from that position, that vantage point. But it's time to look at it from a different vantage point. So um, the first thing that I, I do want to um, say is that um, being the chosen people of God does not give us any type of special privilege. Uh, we are not to be these um, tyrannical uh, people who are looking to rule the world. Uh, we are not to be seen as superior to any other nation. Um, God made it clear that for Israel, he chose them not because they were a large nation, but because they were a small nation. Not simply because they were a small nation, but because they were a small nation that worshiped only the most high God. They didn't worship idols. They didn't worship the sun. They didn't worship the moon. They worshiped the most high God and the most high alone. And so uh, God called them out to be an example to the world, to lead people to God. In fact, if we if we look at um, the giving of the law, uh, prior to the law being given, there was there was no um, outright uh, "Thou shalt not" and "Thou shalt." Uh, everything was written on men's hearts. Men knew what right and wrong were. Uh, the reason that God gave the Ten Commandments in the wilderness is because, as the scripture said, that the people were being stiff-necked. They were being uh, ungrateful. Um, the, the, the hatred that uh, Moses and Aaron encountered or endured during the Exodus was egregious. And uh, God calls, called them boys out and said, listen, he said, tell, he told Moses, he said, go and tell him, after, after I done took you out of Egypt and I showed you how great I was, you still feel like, and I'm paraphrasing, you still feel like you can uh, be on my level. You can take care of yourself better than I can. So live up to my standards. 
you do the things that I can do. You you can do that, and I will make you a nation of priests and kings. So uh, it was for someone, one of our, our forefathers to step up and say, hold on, hold on, we can't do that. There's no way we can do that because we're not you. And we apologize, we repent. Instead, our ancestors said, okay, Moses, go tell God, well, sure, whatever he, whatever he wants us to do, we can do it. That's right, we can, we can do it. And Moses said, all right, well, let's go tell him. And it's like, no, 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 you go tell him. Because we know if we come into God's presence, we're going to show God. So at that very moment, they understood that they could not live up to the standards. But from that point to this one, there's been this uh, trying to trick God into believing that they are or were capable of doing the things that he asked of them. Uh, look, at what, look at what Moses says in Deuteronomy 29. Um, let's see. Where, where do I want to start? Let's start at 2919. This is Moses talking. He says, And it come to pass, when he heareth the words of this curse, that he bless himself in his heart, saying, I shall have peace, though I walk in the imagination of my heart, to add drunkenness to thirst. The Lord will not spare him, but then the anger of the Lord, and his jealousy shall smoke against that man, and all the curses that are written in this book shall lie upon him, and the Lord shall blot out his name from under heaven. And the Lord shall separate him unto evil out of all the tribes of Israel, according to all the curses of the covenant that are written in this book of the law. So again, uh, to tell people that we must go back to living under law is to tell people that we are to remain under a curse because there's no way that we can physically, mentally, or spiritually uphold any of the laws of the commandments. I mean, we might, we might do them today, but what's going to happen tomorrow or the day after that or, or next year or in our times of weakness five years from now there's no way for us to maintain or to um, do those things of the law so we've got to change our perspective we've got to quit telling people that we are to live under law in fact the reason that christ came when he says he came for the lost uh, sheep of israel he came because he knew that he had to get us from under the curse. Secondarily to that, he took on what our initial responsibility was and in teaching all the other nations how to worship the Most High God in, in purity and truth. So these are the things, these are this is the, the general foundation when it comes to being um, or considering yourself a Hebrew or as some would say, a Hebrew Israelite, uh, with all of these different factions that have gone up, uh, these are the things that we've got to pay attention to. We, we've got to definitely, definitely make sure that we're not setting people up for failure, especially if we're going to brand ourselves as leaders. Um, in fact, um, that's, that's the thing that um, James was talking about. Don't, don't call yourself a teacher. Because being a teacher, it's not, it's not that God is necessarily going to hold you accountable if you mislead people, but you're going to be um, challenged a lot, and you're going to be smacked around a lot, and you've got to make sure that you're on your P's and Q's, that you understand the scripture and um, what, what is really going on. So, um, I hear people... 
I hear people, uh, my, a lot of my church friends saying, there's no way in the world that black people are your children. I mean, look at 1948, the Jews uh, made their way back to Israel. Uh, they, they've been rebuilding Israel. Um, the only rebut I would have to that, um, that, I would, that I would actually give time to, would be, yeah, but the land is not at peace. Um, Christ, uh, I'm sorry, God said that when, in fact, he returned Israel to the land that there would be peace in the land, that the land would flourish on its own. Um, and these people were um, bust in on these uh, cargo ships. Um, the land didn't begin to flourish on its own. Um, they went in, they made war with so many people, they killed and maimed so many people, um, they destroyed so many communities, they uh, ransacked uh, so many people's lives so <clears throat> so um, they did not exude the peace that um, God said he would bring to the land uh, once he returned his people to the land so um, we're not, I'm not going to I'm not going to argue about that a whole lot uh, in fact Let's, let's go to Genesis 10. Let's go to Genesis 10. All right. Genesis 10 um, is known as the Table of Nations. Um, and I, I think this, this, this is a very, um, a, a very good place to um, put a pin uh, when, when we're talking about nationalities. In the Table of Nations, we're told where all the children of Noah set. We're given uh, names, locations, and the like. I would like to, I would, I would like to take some time to just go over uh, Genesis, Genesis 10. Let's, let's, Let's look into Genesis 10, just a bit. All right. These are generations of the sons of Noah. Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And unto them were born sons after the flood. The sons of Japheth, Gomer, Magog, Madai, and Javan, and Tubal, and Meshech, and Tyrus, and the sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz, Raphath, and Togorma, the sons of Javan, Elisha, Tarshish, Kitim, and Dodanim. By these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands. Everyone after his tongue, after their families, in their nations. Verse 5 again. Genesis 10, 5. By these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands. Everyone after his tongue, after their families, in their nations. So verses 1 through 5 of chapter 10 of Genesis covers the Gentile nations. And I think it's critical to, um, to understand that the Jews who are now in Israel are the Ashkenazi Jews, or the Jews of Ashkenaz, or the Japhetic Jews, or the Gentile Jews. And remember, Christ said that uh, that Jerusalem would be trodden under the feet of the Gentiles until he returns. So I think this is critical, crucial information for us to take note of. That Ashkenaz is mentioned as a Gentile son. But to go further, because there's this, um, there's also been this teaching um, that started um, during abolition. Uh, 
uh, to try to 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 uh, what's the word? Uh, they wanted to um, verify. I don't want to say verify. Um, they wanted to make sure that the world did not um, become sentimental to the slaves. So they began calling us Hamites. And the word got around that our people were of Hamitic origin. But again, the Table of Nations does, does a very good job of telling us who these Hamitic nations are. So beginning at verse number 6 of Genesis 10, And the sons of Ham, Cush, Misraim, Phut, and Canaan. And the sons of Cush, Seba, Havila, Sabta, Raama, Sabteka. And the sons of Raama, Sheba, and Dedan. And Cush begot Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. Nimrod, he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, and Eric, and Akkad, and Kalna, and the land of Shinar. I'm going to stop there. Because Babel is Babylon. Akkad is Akkadian. And the land of Shinar, we know, is um, in um, what is known as Mesopotamia. So these are the people who the Most High called the Hamitic people. Um, they had the cities of Nineveh. Um, so the, the people of Nineveh and the people of Mitzrayim were um, cousins. They were brothers' children. So that means that the people of uh, Mitzrayim also looked like the children of Nineveh. Now, uh, I need you to just to go here with me. Um, let go of all your presuppositions. Uh, let go of everything that you have been taught or that uh, people have um, pounded into you to make true uh, so that we can uh, get through this. They're also brothers or cousins to the children of Canaan. Now, if we skip on down to verse number 19. Well, no, let's go to verse number 18. And the Arvadite and the Zamorite and the Hamathite and afterward were the families of the Canaanites spread abroad. So these people spread abroad across their land. And where was their land? Verse 19, And the border of the Canaanites was from Sidon, as thou comest to Gerar, unto Gaza, as thou goest unto Sodom and Gomorrah, and Adma, and Zobaim, even unto Lashah. These are the sons of Ham, after their families, after their tongues, in their countries, and in their nations. Now, the sons of Ham are the descendants of the area called the Middle East, the Near East. Uh, they are the Pakistanis, the people of India, people of Iraq, Iran, uh, the people of uh, what is known as Persia, again, um, Babylon, uh, the Canaanites, uh, the Amorites, those people who lived in Palestinia, 
the original Palestinians before the Hebrews came into the area. These were uh, the people of Ham. These were the Hamites. All of these people have white skin. The reason the name Cush means a burnt face is because they were white skinned people who were very dark from uh, what they thought was the sun. So, um, no, the, the Negro, the black man, the African American, the African, we are not Hamites. I'm going to say that again. We are not. Hamites. We are indeed Shemites. Now, when it comes to uh, pinpointing uh, country names, we have a hard way to go when it comes to the Table of Nations. Um, because it gives us a list of names. The children of Shem. Elam, Asher, Arphaxid, Lud, Aram, and up in the children of Aram, Uz, Ha'u, Hul, and Gether, and Mash. Now, if you're if you're careful, if you're a careful study, you see that Shem and Ham also have descendants named Asher. They also have descendants named Aram. Now, the, the Hamitic Aram came on the scene uh, uh, years later, uh, which is why when you read the Bible, uh, Padan Aram is translated uh, Mesopotamia uh, because um, there is an Aram who was a descendant of Ham. But uh, Padan Aram is not of Hamitic origin. It is of Shemitic origin. And uh, again, you pay attention, the Shemites and the Hamites did not share the same territory. All right, so how do we determine who or how the Africans are the people of Shem? All right, so. Let's go to 25, verse 25. And under Eber were born two sons. The name of one was Peleg, for in his days was the earth divided, and his brother's name was Joktan. Joktan begot Almodad, Shelev, and Hazarmaveth, and Jeru, and Hadaram, and Uzal, and Dikla, and Obal, and Abimael. And Sheba, and Ophir, and Havilah, and Jobab, all these were the sons of Joktan. And their dwelling was from Mesha, as thou goest unto Safar, a mount of the east. These are the sons of Sham, after their families, after their tongues, and their lands, after their nations. These are the families of the sons of Noah, after their generations in their nations and by these were the nations divided in the earth after the flood so when, when you hear a lot of uh, people teaching on um, finding quote-unquote Africans in the Bible they don't start here they go to passages um, that have been translated Ethiopian um, and that sort of thing but they don't tell you if they know that where the, where the Bible translates um, Ethiopian, the name that is being translated is the name Cush. As we've seen, Cush is a son of Ham. He's not a son of Shem. So also being uh, Cush, their origins or their family ties are to the area known as the Middle East, not Africa. But 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 how do we get to how do we get to the, the African people being Semitic? Okay. Well, 
let's look at um, the first part where it says and their dwelling this is this is verse number 30 their dwelling was from Misha as thou goest unto Safar a mount of the east so where is the mount so far it's in the east so if the mount so far is in the east that means that the children of Shem dwelt from whatever that western point is up to the mount so far in the east so when we when we do the so when we do the search Mount Safar is in Yemen. It's a it's a it's a mountain range in Yemen. Yemen is on the southern tip of the Arabian Peninsula. Now, a lot of theologians try to say that Misha, being in the east, is actually I'm sorry, Misha being in the west is actually northwest because they don't want to acknowledge the true direction or the, the directional pattern that they would have to follow. If you would go west from the Mount Safar to its extremity, it takes you back to West Africa. So um, Misha is presumably located in Africa somewhere. Now, I'm not going to say for certain that it's in West Africa because I can't say that for sure. But definitely, Misha is in Africa. And, and we all know that there are no white-skinned people in the African interior. In fact, uh, we do know that there have always been a tribe of Africans who were Jews known as Abyssinians. Um, there have been historical writings that, um, that tell that Abyssinians guarded the sacred tombs of all the biblical patriarchs back before the um, Gentiles took over the land. So, I'm not saying that Gentiles haven't ever lived in the land, but before they took over the land, before they uh, pushed us completely out of the land, Abyssinians guarded the sacred places of all of the patriarchs, all of our forefathers. Now that was just that was just one point, but let's let's look a little bit further. Um, now, Jackson. Being a son of Shem, had a few children. Namely, one that we're familiar with is Sheba. Um, Sheba, being a son of Joktan, had a queen who visited King Solomon. And we all know the story of how when she visited King Solomon, um, she was impressed by um, how he ruled. Um, she bought a lot of gifts from her home. Um, also, um, we're told that um, she became pregnant and she took a child back to modern day Ethiopia. Um, and um, that's how, quote unquote, the Ethiopians became Jews. But if we, if we, are careful and we look a little further in verse 29 it tells us that um, that uh, Jackson had a son named Ophir and what is what is the significance of this son named Ophir um, as brother to Sheba Ophir was a very Ophir was a very special place to Israel, specifically to King Solomon. 
um, if we if we uh, just look a little further into Ophir, um, First Kings nine twenty eight, and they came to Ophir and fetched from thence gold four hundred and twenty talents and brought it to King Solomon. Hmm. Wow. First Kings chapter 10, verse 11. And the navy also of Haram that brought gold from Ophir, brought in from Ophir great plenty of almond trees and precious stones. Let's see, what else can we find about Ophir? 1 Kings 22, sorry, 1 Kings 22, 48, Jehoshaphat made ships of Tarshish to go to Ophir for gold, but they went not, for the ships were broken at Ezion Geber. Um... First Chronicles 123. Nope, nope. That just goes back over the table nation. Uh, First Chronicles 29.4. Even 3,000 talents of gold of the gold of Ophir and 7,000 talents of refined silver to overlay the walls and the houses with them. The gold for things of gold and the silver for things of silver for all manner of work to be made by the hands of an artificer. The reason that uh, Ophir is significant is because again, Ophir was a Shemite. Ophir was the brother to Sheba. We know the queen of Sheba was of African descent. Many scholars try to say that she's from Arabia, but even being from Arabia, Ophir can't be from Arabia because um, here uh, Haram needed ships to go to Ophir. It didn't say chariots. It didn't say um, wagons. It didn't say caravans. It said ships to go to Ophir. Um, also, um, King Solomon, the scripture tells us, had a fleet of ships on the Red Sea because he had a navy that sailed often to Ophir. Not just for gold and almond trees, but they got um, jewels, they got exotic animals, um, they got exotic plants, they got a number of things. So Ophir is, um, I believe, uh, of, of African, what is known as African origin. Um, so again, this is just to, to give a proper proper perspective this is so that um, maybe just maybe somebody might say oh my god we've been lied to all this time um, and I and I, I know that uh, this is this is just a, a, a little segment um, but um, let's 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 look a little bit further um, there's there's a there's something else that I, I wanted to touch on. Now, we've been told, or it's been translated in scripture, that the Jews were from Ur of the Chaldees, right? The scripture has been translated to say that the Jews are from Ur of the Chaldees, um, but there's a there's a, a scripture that I want to read here. Okay, so let's look at um, what Isaiah twenty three thirteen says. Isaiah chapter twenty three. 
verse number 13. Behold the land of the Chaldeans. Again, this is about the Jews or the children of Shem or um, Abram being from Ur of the Chaldees. Um, it's translated that uh, many times in the scripture. Isaiah 23, 13, 16. Behold the land of the Chaldeans. This people was not till the Assyrian founded it for them that dwell in the wilderness. They set up the towers thereof they raised up the palaces thereof, and he brought it to ruin. So, again, the Chaldees was an area that was built by their Assyrians. It says, it doesn't say that this, um, this land was not. It said this people was not this nation was not the persons or members of this land were not before the Assyrians uh, created so um, I honestly believe that um, there has been some manipulation of the scripture uh, mainly mainly because um, the people who did the translating um, only had one vantage point. They only saw white people and uh, the lands of white people as being where quote unquote special things happen. So they 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 used the incorrect or improper vantage point um, to try to name things of scripture. Now, um, again. When we're talking about getting the proper perspective. The children of Shem are the people of Africa. The children of Shem are the people of Africa. This is why Paul was confused to be an Egyptian now um, again let me let me let me back up because I did um, I did make the point to say that the uh, children of Mitzrayim or Africa were Hamites but the original Egypt was in Sudan the original Egypt was a nation of black people I don't know what happened, uh, what caused uh, the creation of a union between um, the children of Ham, Mitzrayim, with the children of Sudan, and create the metropolitan known as Egypt. But Egypt was like a, a, a was like an America of the time. It had it had uh, many people there after this uh, compact or agreement between um, these people groups. Uh, now, um, I'm not trying to be disrespectful. I'm simply going through scripture, showing what the scripture says about certain things. And, and again, this is critical information. Um, this information is needed if we're going to get a proper perspective. So, um, again, uh, we know the children of um, Japheth, or the Gentiles, settled uh, the nations, uh, the, the scripture calls them the nations, but specifically, uh, one of the uh, Gentile groups, uh, which is Ashkenaz, is where the Ashkenazi Jews come from. Uh, they're... Uh, Gentiles. The children of Ham, we know from Scripture, are the people who are quote unquote Middle Eastern. The children of Ham are the people who are Middle Eastern. 
the children of Shem are the Africans. Now, I know that doesn't sit well with many people. I know that doesn't sit well with many people. So, um, let's, 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 let's dive a little bit deeper um, so that we can um, get this perspective. Um, let's go to Joshua. Let's go to Joshua. Um, Joshua. Let's go to Joshua 24. Let's go to Joshua 24. Uh, where are we going to start? All right. So we'll start with we'll start with uh, Joshua 24 verse one. And Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and called for the elders of Israel and for their heads and for their judges and for their officers. And they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said unto all the people, Thus said the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood in old time, even Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nacor, and they served other gods. Again, verse number two. And Joshua said unto all the people, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood in old time. Even Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nacor, and they served other gods. So, um, the first time that uh, the Spirit of God pulled this verse out for me, I was I was doing some I was doing some study, and for many years. I always read over the scripture uh, and, and there may be some just like me uh, but every time I read this scripture in, in, in the past before I before I had been shown this I always just bypassed it because anytime you have mention of the flood you think of Noah's flood but um, as I was reading I was stopped and the question came to mind how could the children of Israel have forefathers who lived during Noah's flood now again it didn't say your progenitor Noah it said your forefathers, meaning the people who came before you, lived in old time on the other side of the flood. So what is where is this flood? It, it definitely wasn't speaking of Noah's flood, because we know that Noah and um, his his children are the only ones who survived the flood. And I know that there's some who may be saying, well, um, of course it's the flood of old because we know that um, Noah and his sons did come from the other side of the flood. Well, let's, let's read a little bit further down. Verse number three. And I took your father Abraham from the other side of the flood and led him throughout all the land of Canaan and multiplied his seed and gave him Isaac. So now, Knowing that um, Abraham lived on the other side of the flood, we know that it's not talking about Noah's flood. So what is this flood that it's talking about? And I know somebody's going to say, well, um, if you look at the word flood, it means river. So obviously they're talking about um, the river um, Jordan. Okay. Well, let's see if Jordan, if the Jordan River comes up at any time <clears throat> during this dialogue. So let's let's look and see if Jordan, if the River Jordan is mentioned at all in the scripture. Um, if we look at chapter 24, 
verse number eight. And I brought you into the land of the Amorites, which dwelt on the other side of Jordan, and they fought with you, and I gave them into your hand that ye may possess their land. And I destroyed them from before you. Hmm. So, the flood wasn't talking about the River Jordan. We've, uh, we've, dis we've discovered that Ur of the Chaldees didn't exist. Uh, if you look at maps today, they have Ur being on the southern border of the uh, the Euphrates Euphrates Delta. So there wasn't a flood or river per those maps that the children of Israel could have lived over. Now I know this is a conflict. This 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 draws a lot of conflict because um, in in everything that's translated, even from the Bible to the books of the Apocrypha, everything names the area known as Mesopotamia or um, the children, the the land of the Hamites, as the origin of the children of Shem. When in actuality, we have to realize that all of those mentionings are translations. They're translations. Um, now, let's see. I want to. I want to. I want to. I want to. I want to look at something. I want to look at something else. I want to look at something else to see if we can verify beyond shadow of a doubt and I, I know there's going to be a lot of doubt uh, because when I first when I first saw this information I was so uh, taken aback um, and I, I didn't want to believe it myself but uh, through much prayer through much um, study um, I finally came to grips with had to realize that what I was reading, what I was seeing was fact, was truth. So um, let's go to, let's go to my guys, Esau and Jacob. Esau and Jacob. Genesis 25. We're going to begin at verse 23. And the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. And one people shall be stronger than the other, and the elder shall serve the younger. And when her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red all over, like a hairy garment, and they called his name Esau. And after that came his brother out, and his hand took on Esau's heel, and his name was called Jacob. And Isaac was threescore years old when she buried him. Isaac was 60 years old when she buried him. Now, why was it important for Esau's color to be mentioned. Uh, because uh, you, you have a lot of, uh, again, theologians, historians, um, preachers, um, seminary professionals who say that um, the, the word red means to um, be red to see the blood through the skin like if somebody was slapped but that that really doesn't make much sense uh, 
because there, there are other mentions of that word bread throughout Scripture. Um, specifically, it talks about um, in the last days um, when the horsemen of the, the apocalypse are released, that there will be one uh, rider on a red horse. Now, because of the Greek influence upon our Romanized culture, we see a blood red horse because of mythology and the mythological teachings that uh, even children are indoctrinated into in schools today. But that word red comes from the word ruddy, which means brown. No matter if you put in your Google search bar right now, ruddy horse, or ruddy animal, you're going to find a brown horse, brown duck, uh, brown cow. Uh, they're not going to be blood red. So when Esau was born, he was born ruddy. In other words, Esau was dark skinned out the morning dark skin and hairy. Um, and, and I know a lot of people like to spiritualize everything, but um, the Bible, I believe, is um, a historical uh, book. It's, uh, it's a spiritual book. And it's also uh, a book of reference. So the reason that Esau's color is mentioned is because there would be a day like today where Israel would have to know who they are and what's really going on. So um, if we look at Esau, uh, if we look at we look through these passages beginning at Genesis 25, color plays a big part in a lot of the things, the decisions that are made. Um, Esau being dark skinned, married Hittite women. We've, we've already discovered that the Hittite women were Hamites who had white skin, like the people known as Iraqi, uh, like the people who are um, Saudi Arabian, uh, like the Palestinians. These people were white-skinned people. And so Esau being born dark married white women because uh, I'm sure that he had a complex, um, which is why it was, it was necessary for his color to be mentioned. Um, but if we, if, we look, if we look further into it, um, the way that we know that color was important uh, well before I go there let me let me do this I want to I want to put a pin there because um, I know there's been a lot of talk about the um, white man being Esau and um, you have a lot of uh, you have a lot of uh, Hebrew Israelite teachers who will spew you down that Esau is white man today because um, of the fact that um, white men pretty much have quote unquote um, the hegemony of the day. But uh, the scripture tells us or God tells us, if indeed the white man is Esau. Deuteronomy 23, verse 7. And this is for all of the people who want to hate white people. Um, when God calls us to love everybody. In fact, again, um, the only reason Israel was chosen was because they were a small nation who served the Most High. And God wanted them to show the world how to be 
good service, to be uh, good, uh, to to worship only the Most High. I'll say that. Uh, but Deuteronomy twenty three seven. Thou shalt not Abur an Edomite, for he is thy brother. Thou shalt not Abur an Egyptian, because thou was a stranger in his land. Thou shalt not Abur an Edomite. You can't hate an Edomite. That is, that is the word of God. Now, I'm not saying that um, if white people are not Edomites, you can hate them. But I'm just drawing this, this verse out because there's so much hatred when it comes to uh, a lot of the people who are teaching on um, Hebrew doctrines. Deuteronomy 23 and 7 tells us we can't hate an Edomite. So if you believe that white men are Edomites, you are to be especially kind to them because they are your brothers. And that is a command from the Most High God. Um, but I got I got sidetracked. Um, let's go. Again, we're, we're talking about Esau. And we're talking about um, we're talking about uh, the importance of color and scripture. So Genesis 27 46 and Rebecca said to Isaac I am weary of my life because of the daughters of Heth if Jacob take a wife of the daughters of Heth such as these which are the daughters of this land what good shall my life do me Genesis 28 Verse 1, And Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him and said unto him, Thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. Arise, go to Padan Aram, to the house of Bethuel, thy mother's father, and take thee a wife from thence of the daughters of Laban, thy mother's brother. Let's go down to 28.6. When Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away to Badan Aram to take him a wife from thence, and that as he blessed him, he gave him charge, saying, Thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan, and that Jacob obeyed his father and his mother and was gone to Badan Aram. And Esau, seeing that the daughters of Canaan pleased not Isaac his father, then went Esau unto Eshmael, and took unto the wives which he had, Mahala, the daughter of Ishmael, Abram's son, the sister of Nebaha, to be his wife. So after Esau saw that his mother was not pleased with uh, white with these the, the white women, not because she didn't like white women, but because um, she feared that after a few generations, none of her grandchildren would be like her. She said, I am in fear that if my son, my second son also take wives, take a wife of this land, what good will my life do me? So I know somebody saying, well, that, that don't prove that. We know that um, the Canaanites had a curse put on them by Noah um, and that course being the family these things trickle down through time yada 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 so on and so forth well let's go let's look a little bit further let's let's go on down um let's see all right and genesis 29 16 genesis 29 16 and Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah was tender-eyed, but Rachel was beautiful and well-favored. And Jacob loved Rachel and said, I will serve thee seven years for Rachel, thy younger daughter. 
Now, a lot of people like to say that it was because Rachel, I'm sorry, it was because Le Leah was ugly. They want to say it was because Leah was ugly that Jacob wanted Rachel. But let's, uh, let's, 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 uh, let's review that. So when we look at the word tender, the words tender eye, the word for tender is the Hebrew word rock. Transliterated, it's R-A-K. It means tender, soft, or delicate. The word eyed can mean a number of things. A physical, well, it's the, it's the Hebrew word ayin. Um, and whenever it's found in scripture, whenever, um, it's, uh, it's, it's found in scripture. Believe it or not, it means color. So uh, Leah was not ugly. She was of soft color. She was of tender color, meaning she was fair skinned. Not that she was white, but she was a light skinned African. Now, whether that means she was albino, um, we know the name Laban means white. Um, maybe they were light-skinned. Uh, but we know that she wasn't ugly. But Rachel, on the other hand, found favor, found favor with Jacob because she looked more like his mother. She was perfectly shaped and she had the perfect complexion. So again, um, Leah was not ugly. She was just light-skinned. Showing or proving that color was something that was important to mention in scripture. Um, furthermore, knowing that, uh, that uh, Jacob went to get a wife that looked more like his mother, we can understand that it wasn't until after Rachel got pregnant with her first child that Jacob was ready to go back home because he did what he'd set out to do. He had given his mom some grandkids that looked more than like him. So, um, <clears throat> Color was very important. Again, when it comes to perspective, when we're, when we're getting the proper perspective, we have to understand that uh, our viewpoint, our vantage point, has not always been one of clarity because of the things that we've been taught um, these last uh, 400 years. I say 400 because prior to, um, everyone knew that the Jews were black people. Um, there are a number of history books that prove it. Um, let, me, let me back up. Let me rephrase that. There are a number of books historically that prove it. It's not written in, in the American history books, but there are books um, that are from the 1700s that do uh, mention, uh, there are books from the 1800s that do mention that the Jews resided in Africa. Uh, if you read careful study, uh, books on the Inquisition tell you that uh, any time uh, someone was acquitted from, or somebody admitted to, uh, to being one who observed the uh, kosher laws in uh, Hebrew, they were sentenced to uh, African 
nations and their slaves during the 16, 17 years. Proving that the Jews are of African descent. Um, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to stretch this out any longer. Um, there are, there are many other instances um, in Scripture. I, I, I say let's go to one last place. Uh, that, that one last place that I, that I want to venture to. Is Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. Numbers chapter 12. Start at um, verse 1. And Miriam and Aaron spake against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married, for he had married an Ethiopian woman. And they said, Hath the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? Hath he not spoken also by us? And the Lord heard it. Now the man Moses was very meek above all men which were upon the face of the earth. The Lord spake suddenly unto Moses and unto Aaron and unto Mary, Come ye three unto the tabernacle of the congregation. And they three came out. And the Lord came down in the pillar of the cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam, and they both came forth. And he said, Hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision and I will speak unto him in a dream. My servant Moses is not so, who is faithful in all mine house. With him will I speak mouth to mouth, even apparently, and not in dark speeches. And the similitude of the Lord shall, be, be, shall he behold. Wherefore then, were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and he departed. And the cloud departed off the tabernacle, and behold, Miriam became leprous, white as snow. And Aaron looked upon Miriam, and behold, she was leprous. And Aaron said unto Moses, Alas, my Lord, I beseech thee, lay not this sin upon us, wherein we have done foolishly, and wherein we have sinned. Let her not be as one dead, of whom the flesh is half consumed, when he cometh out of his mother's womb. Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, Heal her now, O God, I beseech thee. And the Lord said unto Moses, If her father had spit in her face, should she not be ashamed seven days? Let her be shut out from the camp seven days, and after that let her be received again. And Miriam was shut out from the camp seven days, and the people journeyed not until Miriam was brought in again. That was uh, Numbers 12, 1 through 15. But again, we've established that anytime you see the name Ethiopian in scriptures, it's translated from the name Cush. Cush, again, just to go down the line, is a descendant of Ham. Meaning the Hamites were those who dwelt in the land known as the Middle East. These people are people of white skin. Miriam and, and Aaron were mad at Moses for marrying an Ethiopian woman. Again, Miriam and Aaron were mad at Moses for marrying a white woman. God showing that he was against all types of hatred based on ethnicity turned Miriam also to a white-skinned woman. 
Now, just to give a little background, we're talking about a haughty people. We're talking about a race of black people who saw black as the best thing on this on this on God's green earth. And so God was given a message that he despised all types of hatred based on skin color. And so I guess I I guess I'll leave it here for this this perspective teaching. Yes, indeed, the children of Shem are black people. Yes, indeed, the people known as African American are the sons of Jacob. Yes, indeed, we have been stirred up and we are beginning to come out of our slavery. But while we're doing that, the Most High God wants us to know that hatred is not his agenda. The Most High God wants us to know that in us waking up to be who we are, that spewing all kinds of hateful talk, hateful speech, uh, cutting people off from their families, telling people uh, that they have to live under the law, telling people that we're better than anybody else, it's not of God. So when we begin to change our perspective, whether we're white or black, whether we consider ourselves Christians, non-Christians, uh, whether we consider ourselves uh, Hebrew, Hebrew Israelite, what have you, uh, whether we consider ourselves the, the uh, spiritual grafting in of Jacob, God is not for hatred. Anytime hatred has been the driver in society, God has called for repentance. So as we move forward on this first episode, I am blatantly, I am saying matter of fact, that it's time for us to put away the hatred first for ourselves secondly for people of other origins and focus on the most high and who he's called us to be and why he's called us so until the next episode I just want to say uh, thank you for sticking out with sticking out with me. Uh, continue to go through this lesson. Go back over all of the verses that were given, and don't be afraid of what you see in Scripture, because as Christ said in the wilderness. Man is not to live off of bread alone, but from every word that proceeded from the mouth of God. And we believe that the scripture is the infallible word of God Almighty. So we've got to stand strong in understanding who we are and whose we are. I love you. Peace.